how does somebody know, right, if they're in the right zone without measuring their heart rate? This study kind of showed that even though they thought they were getting an excellent workout because they checked for like perceived enjoyment, how hard it was, all these things, they said, this is great. Like there was a great workout. It was very hard, blah, blah, blah. But really, when you look at their heart rate, they never got to the same heart rates as the evidence-based protocols. So it's not enough to think you trained really hard. And literally the same thing happened to me this morning at this endurance event. I thought it was such a hard workout. I was ready to see how much percentage was in zone five and it was like less than 1%. So it's not enough to be breathing heavy and hurting. You've got to have some objective feedback. Mm. So and you I need think, to really look at your heart rate. I think rate. you need to measure your heart rate. Okay. Yeah. So then let's, let's break this down for people and this is also going to help with the zone two calculations. How does someone calculate their max heart rate We've spoken about this a little bit before and we've spoken a lot offline. 220 minus age is the common calculation that everyone's heard, but there are better calculations. Mm. So how do you how, how would you like people to kind of navigate that space to step step one, the listener right now, calculate their max heart rate? Short of not having a wearable that's telling them what their max heart rate is. Right. By the way, I think the wearables use an equation that is the simple one. I'm pretty sure most wearables will just use 220 minus your age because when you have start your profile, you tell them your age, they just do a quick calculation. There are so many calculations out there to calculate max heart rate. Um, the one that I have been leaning on, I can't remember the exact numbers here. It's a bit numbery. We it's, can put the, we the can, exact calculations in Because the there's, there's, there's dozens, but it's something like, do you remember? Well, there was a... Uh, a one for females and one for males. Right. There's also gender-specific ones. Gulati well. was the female one. Right. Um, the Carvernon method is for heart rate reserve, which we spoke about. That takes into account your resting heart rate. So either way, there's going to be, in the show notes, there'll be a calculation yeah. for male and for female. I think it wasn't it like 200, 208 minus 0. 0.7 times age or something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then 211. Right. And there was a 209. Like it was, right. They're all close. At the end of the day- no matter which one you use, they're going to be pretty much one or two or three beats off what you probably are. And again, just remember, this is a calculation. Th- this this calculator does not know your actual physical ability or your fitness or how your heart is developed. and It doesn't know. So you, it might spit out 185 as your max heart rate. You might then jump on a VO2 test and it shows you that it's like 200 beats per minute. So it doesn't know. It's a ballpark, which again, I'm in support of what Inigo was saying is heart rate alone is not good enough as a measure for the intensity of your workouts because of this exact thing. There's variation between individuals. The calculations for max could be a little bit off. Anyway, theoretically, you're going to calculate your max heart rate using one of these calculations. And all you need to know for that is your age and your sex. That's it. Correct. You're going to use that if you want. If you want to keep this really simple, you're going to try keep your heart rate between about 60 to 70. We'll say 60 to 70 because that's like the popularized version of zone two. 60 to 70% of that number, your max heart rate, is your target zone. So you're going to jump on the bike, start pedaling. It'll take a little, it'll take a few minutes to get into zone two. I don't know if you've checked this for yourself. It's really interesting. Sometimes it takes me like 10, 15 minutes to get into to, to the like perfect zone two. Um, Spend your workout in zone two, meaning in that heart rate range, and cross-check with a few other variables, right? So you're going to see, do you pass a talk test? If there was a mate next to you on a bike or if you're on the phone, could you have a conversation? Sure, you're going to be a bit puffy, but you should be able to talk, right? In comparison, if you're doing a zone five hit workout, you'll barely be able to say a word, right? You're really exhausted. Um, if you can try the nasal breathing, I recommend that because that that'll regulate your intensity naturally. Um, as soon as you, or even do this test, this is interesting. Push to zone, so sit in zone two, nasal breathe, and then crank up your either your reps per minute, your how quickly you're pedaling, your cadence, or crank up the resistance a little bit. So your your RPM might drop, but the resistance is up. We're so talking your body, about a bike here, a stationary a bike. bike. I'm talking about stationary bike. And then go hard and see your heart rate go into zone three and four and you, you won't be able to nasal breathe. You literally will almost pass out. You'll have to open your mouth and start taking in big breaths. So I think, I mean, I think just let's keep it simple. Have a, have a target heart rate, know how to do the talk test and all these things. Um, and then the same, so that was zone two, which was calculate your max heart rate using those 
calculations we'll put in the show notes. You multiply that max heart rate by 0. 0.6 mm-hmm. and also by 0. 0.7. Yep. That'll give you your your lower bound and your upper bound for your zone two. Yep. It'll give you a range. Like it might spit out 110 to 122. Right. right? That's your zone two target range. Yep. Now you uh, you can track your heart rate with your wearable while you're riding. Do the, the torque test. Yep. Can you breathe through your nose? Can yep. you... Uh, are you a little bit puffy, a little bit sweaty? Yep. That's enough for most people. And, and then the next step for them is to think about the duration in that session and across an entire week. Right. And what does that look like? We come back to that. Right. For zone five, you also take that max heart rate. Yep. But instead of multiplying it by the 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.7, which gave you your zone two target range, mm-hmm. we're multiplying by... I like 0.85. Okay, so you take that max heart rate, you multiply by 0.85, and that's where you want your heart rate to be above above that. In your working sets. During those four-minute intervals. Yes, or if you're doing the 60 on, 60 off version that we just explained, during that 60 seconds, try get it above. And the reason why it's... It, the reason why this it works for a 60-second interval and it works for a four-minute interval is because of the work-to-rest ratio. It's all about that ratio. This is a one-to-one ratio. So in the 60 seconds off... Let's say, let's say you get your heart rate to 90% in that, in that hard working set. It's not going to drop that low in 60 seconds off, right? It's not long enough to really recover and get it close to rest, right? Your intensity is going to be higher in that 60 on, 60 off than a four-minute interval. Yeah, because you don't have to really ramp up into it. After three minutes of active rest, if you're fit, you're ready to go. Like it's almost like, like I did this on the rowing machine. And at two minutes, I, I, I was like, I feel ready. I'm going to check the clock. And I was like, yeah, I've got another minute of rest. And I was like, this doesn't feel right. I feel like I'm ready right now. So, yeah, I think that this, I, I reckon this protocol would feel harder just because the rest is shorter for sure. But back to the minimum effective volume. So, I think earlier you said even if you, you can get some positive adaptations if you do a four-minute high-intensity interval session once a week. Yeah. That's four minutes consecutively. What if I choose the 60 second on, 60 off? Mm. If I repeat that four times, Mm -hmm. so I have four minutes of total work, is that equivalent to doing a four minute interval? Yeah, if your time in range is above 85 and it's equivalent, I think it would be. Um, But I I also, I don't know the answer to what the minimum effective dose is for this sort of training, to be honest. I don't know. I think four minutes would be enough to get some adaptation. What's optimal? I don't know. I remember seeing one study, and we can dig it up. Yeah. I think it was people with metabolic syndrome, and it compared one four-minute interval versus right. three or four, mm-hmm. and most of the benefit was from just doing the ones. Right. But there was some extra benefit. Of course. But it was a it was diminishing returns. Exactly right. That's why I'm saying the optimal dose, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I do know that if you just did one hit work, like a, a, an evidence-based protocol per week, which... They roughly last 20 minutes on average, 20 to 30 minutes. If you do that once a week and you truly do it properly, I think that's enough. I don't, I don't think you need to be doing it every day. Certainly not. Hey, friends. The scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12-week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer, better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today. That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. So if I would just want to start off with four minutes a week and I 
and I choose either the four minute consecutive protocol or the 60 on 60 off and I, I walk into the gym and I'm going to do this on a rowing machine you said then it takes about 20 minutes now I, I know the answer to this question but I, I think we need to spell this out yeah I'm not going to walk in there and just go straight into the four minute interval no you're definitely not you're going to you're going to do a, a, a warm up ideally on the machine that you intend to do the workout on so what does that look like so what I like to do, I have what I call a ramp protocol. I put this in my book, in the training program. And this ramp protocol I use for before weights training and I use it before cardio training if it's high intensity training. I don't do a ramp protocol for the zone two because zone two is the intensity of your warm up essentially, right? So the warm up should be in basically zone two. Okay. So what I would do is jump on a rowing machine for four to five minutes at a really nice zone one, two pace. Start in zone one, ease your way into zone two. Try to spend about four or five minutes in zone two on a machine. You just want to feel puffy, a little bit sweaty and warm, right? Just build that sweat and feel like your body temperature is actually increased. Then I like to get off and do a little bit of mobility and stretching, right? So I'll do some like active and dynamic stuff just to get the muscles moving and then get back on the machine and you're going to do a, quite a hard set of only like 10 or 15 strokes at say 60% of your max. Then you're going to do another set at about 70%, then 80%. Then when you feel primed, start your workout. That's when you're going to do that four-minute interval and going nice and hard. But yeah, you're not going to just show up to the gym, jump on a machine, mm -hmm. start sprinting. And if you have just finished your zone two, you've done an hour of zone two, can you go straight into the hit? Like if they're doing what you're, you're doing where you'll do zone two on a bike and then jump on a rowing machine, I would still – prime your body for the run. ramp up a little bit ramp a little bit do 20 seconds or 15 seconds quite hard then do another 15 seconds a little bit harder and just ramp your way up to the intensity mm -hmm. that you think you're going to be pulling for four minutes or whatever the interval is that you're doing okay so let's try and wrap all of this up i'm conscious of trying to give people some takeaways they can grab a hold of yeah like <laughs> the, a real practical takeaway right yeah. the last episode was very uh, in-depth science. I'm not sure whether we've added a lot of clarity yet. <laughs> Hopefully we no, have. I think, I think we have. Hopefully we have. Yeah. Uh, I just don't want to leave people more confused no. um, than, than before they turn this episode on. Yeah, so the, the, the main points here that we, we're making is that you can be very intentional with the cardiovascular training that you're doing. Yes. And understanding your max heart rate to begin with is a good starting point. You can use that to then understand what is your zone two, what is your zone five. When you're in zone two, you're not just going to be relying on heart rate. You're also relying on some of these other cues. Mm -hmm. Can you talk? Are you a bit puffy? Can you breathe through your nose? All that sort of stuff. Someone has, let's say, how much time do you think the average person has a week? to dedicate to cardiovascular training? Just to cardiovascular? Again, it comes down to personal goals. Like some people, do, they, their goal is strong, get stronger or get bigger, right? Hypertrophy. Some people don't care about cardio. In fact, there's this like... I'm thinking about the person who is interested in their health span optimization right. and longevity. Yeah. That's who I'm thinking about right here. Yeah. And... Let's say they have five hours a week mm. and half of that or two, two and a half hours of that is resistance training. Yeah. So they have two and a half hours to do cardiovascular exercise. Yeah. Are they doing 80% of that in zone two? Is that is that where we're sort of guiding them at the well, moment. Well, this is a good example because what you just said there is basically 150 minutes for zone two, or sorry, for cardiovascular training and 150 minutes for resistance training. I think that's a great way to do it. I think that th that's a nice split. It's balanced. You're going to get the best of both worlds. You don't. I don't think you have to spend 80% in zone two, to be honest, If in that example. If you're only dealing with 150 minutes per week, I don't think it should all, well, at least the vast majority should be in zone two. I just don't think that makes all them all that sense I, I think 
I think the way that I explained it before actually is, is a better way. It's that you have a, a dedicated workout for zone two. You have a dedicated workout for a sort of three and four and a dedicated workout for zone five. I like that. But at the end of the day, again, we're getting into the weeds. If you just have 20 to 30 minutes a day that you think you can do some cardio, I really think that the most important thing is that you just do it. And I don't think that it really matters as to what zone you're in and what percentage because you're going to get amazing benefits. This is, where, this is I think, where the conversation with Inigo got a little bit complicated is you're always going to get benefits from all kinds of training. Some of them are more unique than others, but generally speaking, all of this cardio is going to improve your VO2 max. HIT is a more time-efficient way to do it and will improve your cardio respiratory fitness more when you compare HIT to, to, to moderate intensity, but it doesn't mean you don't get benefits from moderate intensity. Right And yes, when you do moderate intensity, you may improve mitochondrial function more than if you only did very high intensity, but you're still getting benefit from the high intensity. Mm -hmm. So it's not black and white. It's not an on-off switch. But if you're the more strapped <clears throat> you are for time, yeah, then the more you may want to lean into the higher intensities. Yeah, if you only have like... Fit, some people do their cardio on the day that they're at the gym doing resistance training. If you're if somebody who, who does that, you're not going to do 60 minutes of zone two and then 45 minutes of weights. Right. So what, what could you do? Do your weights for 30 minutes and then do 15 to 20 minutes of hit. Like really go hard because then you're making the most of that hour. You're definitely going to get the best of, of all worlds if you can do that. That's where hit training is very appealing to people from a, a, an ROI in terms of time invested. Yeah, and studies look at this. They look at exactly this. So they look at moderate intensity continuous training what is the impact on vo2 max and they look at hit training the impact on vo2 max and it's more time efficient you can achieve a vo2 in less time and it's something like an average of like have you, have you seen these studies like 9.7 minutes per session less to reach an equivalent vo2 max improvement so if you're time strapped the uh, hit training is a great way to to get a great workout mm -hmm.